river of living water flowing through you. I know it doesn't praise God. I know when we get in the spirit and we praise God with everything we have, that spirit is what moved upon the face of the waters and created this earth, that created this universe, the power of God that flows inside of us. Hallelujah. Is there rivers of living water running today? Hallelujah, hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. hallelujah. Give a hand praise unto God. Give a hand praise unto the Lord. And I ask you to turn to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, verses 31 through 34. The Spirit of God is in this place. I am so grateful that God has given me the privilege and opportunity to preach the Word of God. Don't take it lightly. I just pray that God speaks and ministers in the way that He's been ministering to me. And I'm asking the Lord just to have His way and to reveal something to someone today to understand about faith. Luke twenty two thirty one 31 says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired to have you, that he may sift you as wheat. But I have prayed for thee that thy faith fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. And he said unto him, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both into prison and to death. And he said, I tell thee, Peter, the cock shall not crow this day before thou, that thou shalt thrice deny that thou knowest me. This morning's message is simply titled, Faith Converted. Faith Converted. Let's bow our heads. Heavenly Father, we give you the praise and we give you the glory, Lord. And Lord, I am praying, Lord, that you open the eyes of our understanding. Revelation, Lord, as you minister to your precious people that are here today, Lord. And I'm praying, Lord, that you minister as the way that you have purpose and plan for this service, God. I am praying, God, to anoint these lips of clay, to use this vessel, Lord, for your honor and your glory, Lord. That your name be magnified in all that you do today, Lord. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. You may take your seats. Need to get into this quickly. And Peter was a man's man. Someone who was confrontational, known, known as being one of the sons of thunder. He was a fisherman by trade, not having great intellect, but admired for his ability to catch fish. His character of not backing down, someone who had fight in him. He was the one that became the proxy leader of the 12 who were called the disciples of Jesus Christ. He was part of the intimate circle of Christ and Peter, James, and John who saw Jesus transfigured. He was the only disciple to walk on water. The disciple that rebuked Jesus when he predicted his death. It was Peter who cut off the ear of the high priest when they came to get Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane. Peter was the one who insisted that he would never forsake Jesus. I will go with you to prison. I will die with you, Jesus. He was a reckless and rough fisherman, a man's man in that day, not weak by any means. But Jesus told him, Satan has desired, he's asked me to allow you to be afflicted. To inwardly agitate your faith to the verge of being overthrown just like wheat. Jesus assured Peter, I have prayed for you. This is the thing that catches my attention. He didn't pray that Peter would lose holiness. Now, I'm going to walk in some place, and people are going to be like, oh, Brother John, you're going places you shouldn't go. He didn't pray for his holiness. 
He didn't pray that he'd give his tithes. He didn't pray that he would, he would sit there and, and never fail. He said, I have prayed for you, Peter, that your faith does not fail. I, I know that's a better word than you guys are, are responding, but I'm telling you this morning, for some of you that are here today, too often and too many times, the way that we react to people within the body of Christ that fall in the body of Christ, and then when they try to get up, and we have a hand and a foot on their back, and we're condemning them, we're rebuking them, we're casting them out, we're pushing them aside. I wonder what we would have done to Peter this was a man that was known as a leader of the disciples. This was a man that was walking on water. This was a man that rebuked and fought and stood up for Christ and cut off his ear. How would we respond to Peter? Because I'll tell you what, in today's church, Peter wouldn't have been accepted. You want him to pastor us? Do you know that he cussed out everybody? Do you, did, did you see what he did down the road and... He cussed out people three times. I've never heard a pastor speak like that. I've never heard, uh, this is a man that was walking with you for three years. We need to be careful. We need to be careful. Because Jesus didn't pray that Peter would never fail. He prayed that his faith would never fail. Amen. Jesus tells him when you're converted, you come back to me. Strengthen, establish the brethren. He wanted Peter's faith to be fully converted because Peter was going to be the instrument that God was going to use to open the doors of salvation to the world as we know it. He preached on the day of Pentecost. He was there when the Samaritans received the word and he laid hands on them and they received the Holy Ghost. He was there when Cornelius was praying and a Gentile needed to hear the word of God. Not accepted by the Jews or any, uh, they, were the, they, were, they were the misfits of society. And he sent him to open up the doors of salvation. Maybe there's a little bit more clear understanding why Peter had to fail. I'll get back to that. Because the understanding of what God has and understanding what Peter had, Peter was a strong man. Peter was a man's man. Peter was the type of man that maybe nowadays we might say he does a little MMA fighting. He's a construction guy. He's, you, you touch him, it's like touching Brother Foster, and it, it's, like touching, it's like touching rock. He was a man's man. You know, I'll be honest with you, if we got in the flesh and Brother Foster said, let's go at it, I'd be like, Brother Foster, I, I don't even want to, you, you do what you're going to do because I don't, I don't even want to try to think of doing that. And not that Brother Foster ever would. But he was a man's man, a strong man. <laughs> but he prayed for his faith. Why does Satan so much want your faith? Why is Satan battling you for your faith? You see, He's not fighting you on your holiness. He's not fighting you on, on your attendance. He's not fighting you on, on, on being saved. He's fighting you on your faith. Because, see, faith, one of the reasons he wants your faith is that faith is the currency of heaven. Hebrews 11.1 1 says, now faith is the substance. It's not invisible. It's, it's an actual substance. Brother Foster, you're talking about this on Friday. It's the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence, the proof that it exists of things that I cannot see. Prayer with faith coming to God is the currency we use to give to God to receive what we're asking from him. Oh, yeah, I mean, you don't understand. When you go to the grocery store and you go out and you say, here, I'm going to give you a Kleenex to buy my groceries today. They are not going to take your Kleenex in exchange for what you're buying. 
You cannot go to God and expect God for him to do great things on your behalf if you come with no faith. Faith is the currency that moves God on our behalf. So why does the devil want your faith? Because he knows it's the currency of heaven. The second reason he wants your faith? Because he knows that faith pleases God. Hebrews 11, 6 says, but without faith, it is impossible to please him. For he that cometh to God must believe that he is and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We know the scripture. We know how to quote it. But if we lose our faith, we have no ability to please the Lord. If I have no faith... And I'm going to get into this a little bit as we go on, but we can come to church and lack faith in places and wonder why God does not answer us. Without faith, it's impossible to please him. If I'm going to get God to respond to me, I better come with faith in my hand. I better come with faith believing that at least he is. He has the ability to save me. I better come because if I don't come with faith... There's no way I can please God. You can worship in this altar. You can dance and speak in tongues. You can, you can run around the church and run up the walls and down. But if you don't have faith, you're not pleasing God. I'm not, I'm not criticizing worship. But sometimes we worship God just because it's an external thing. It has to be birthed with inside here where I believe. You know what? I'm worshiping God. Brother Foster... Hell's against my family, but I'm worshiping God. Hell's against my home, but I'm worshiping God. Why? Because I believe that even though I might be in the pit of hell, God has not left me. That's what stirs up in my heart. You can laugh and you can criticize and you can put, oh, that brother, he's always crying. That brother, he's always, don't criticize their worship. It's faith that bursts that ability to have a true connection and please God. That's why he wants your faith. The third reason is he wants your faith is that faith imputes righteousness. And I want to, this is, this, God's showing me this. I was like, oh God, oh God, blessed is the man Romans 4, 8, and 9 says, blessed is the man to whom the Lord will not impute sin. He won't count sin on your behalf. Hold on. Cometh this blessedness then upon the circumcision only or upon the uncircumcision also. For we say that faith was reckoned. It was accounted. It was given to the account of Abraham for righteousness. That word reckon means to lay one's charge or to pass one's account. It's like if I went into a place, it's the only way I can, I can think of it, and Bill Gates says, use my tab to live off of. I don't care if you're in the negative. I don't care if you have a negative $100. Everything he does is on my account. The foolish thing that we do as Christians, we live that way with God. And we try to spend everything. We Oh, man, I got Bill Gates' account. Woo, I'm going to go buy a car. I'm going to go buy a house. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to buy all these clothes. I'm gonna, and we go live recklessly with the account that we've been given. If the righteousness of God has been imputed to me and given to me the sinless nature of a righteous man that took on the sins of the entire world, that overcame death and hell, has been imputed, accounted on our behalf. How can the righteous man fall seven times and get back up if there is none that is righteous No, not one. Proverbs 24, 16, for a righteous man may fall seven times and rise again. (laughs) You know, Brother Foster, 
I was studying, I was going, oh my God, oh my God. The reason why a righteous man can fall seven times? Wait a second, a righteous man fell? Wait, Peter fell? Wait, sister so-and-so fell? Wait, minister so-and-so fell? Wait, pastor so-and-so fell? Though a righteous man may fall seven times, he will rise again. How does he get back up? <laughs> How does he get back up? It is faith that brings him back up from where he's at. Because it's the righteousness of God that he's walking in. Woo! It's not my goodness. It's not me. Oh, he's a good man. No, God is good. Oh, he's a, she's a great sister. No, it's the righteousness of God you see. Oh. That's why it doesn't matter what you've done. Paul, you killed people. Peter, you cussed people out. Prostitute, you were touching the feet of Jesus. Oh, it doesn't matter. I'm giving you my righteousness. I'm giving you my righteousness. I'm giving you my righteousness. Woo! I got an account that will never go bankrupt. I got an account that never fails. Yeah, I might fall seven times. They say seven. You might add about a hundred to that for me. hundred times seven. Maybe I'll fall 700 times, but as long as my faith stays intact. <laughs> Woo! The devil sits there and says, oh, look at what you've done. And I just say, here's my faith, and here's the righteousness of God. He has nothing on me. He has nothing on me. Oh. Now, I'm not talking you don't need to repent, because you need to repent. <laughs> As long as his faith doesn't fail, Peter, you can get back up again because we are living on the righteous account of Christ. This man, this manly man, Jesus prayed for his faith because his knew his faith, if it remained intact, Peter would have the currency to get heaven's attention. He knew that Peter would have the faith to still please God. He knew that Peter would have the righteousness that was imputed to him to get back up off that ground. You want to hear something even crazier? John 17, 20. He says, I have prayed for them. He prayed for those given to him and to all who will believe in him through their word. You know who that is? It's me. It's all of you. Jesus prayed for us. It makes me wonder, Brother Sal, I think he prayed for my faith. I want to think he prayed for my faith. He didn't pray, Brother John, you, you, need, to, you need to be holy. He didn't and, and don't get me wrong, because people are going to say, Brother John, you don't have to be holy. Stop. He didn't pray that I'd be accepted by everybody. He didn't pray anything but that my faith would not fail. And I thought you guys might be excited. Maybe the pastor don't pray. Maybe I don't pray for you. Maybe the ministry don't pray for you. But you ought to be happy that Jesus prayed for you. Jesus prayed for you. The words of his mouth do not cease. The words of his, are, his mouth are constantly giving life. That means his prayer doesn't die. <laughs> oh, man, I, I'm so glad. I know my wife prays for me. She has to. <laughs> Change that man, Lord. Change that man. My daughter's you too, I know. But I'm excited because Jesus prayed for me. Amen. You see, with faith, with humility equals trust. And I want to convey this very carefully. Our belief, our faith that we have in God doesn't necessarily mean that we fully trust him. Let me explain. 
before you start saying that John, Brother John's preaching heresy and false doctrine. <laughs> you have enough to trust God with your salvation. But it doesn't mean I trust him with my finances. I trust God enough to get, receive the gift of the Holy Ghost, but I don't trust him with my children. I trust God enough to, to help me help me go to church, but I don't trust God with my marriage. I don't trust God with my character. The scriptures we read above speak of faith that is absolute trust in God. It is a trust that says God has created all things. It is a trust that God works all things. It is a trust that God moves all things. It is a trust that God sees all things. It is a trust that God hears all things. It's a trust that God knows all things. You don't believe me? Israel had enough faith to leave Egypt, but they didn't trust God enough to get them into the promised land. They trusted God enough to go out and get the manna. And they believed God enough, excuse me, let me flip it around. They believed God enough to get manna, but they didn't trust him to provide it every day. Why? Because they were rebuked because they kept going out on Sundays. They kept going out on the day of the Sabbath, and they were trying to collect more manna because they didn't trust that God was going to provide enough for them to survive for two days. For many of us, we come to church and we believe God for our salvation, but we don't believe God enough to heal our body. We believe God enough to come in and worship God and, and give our praise to God and, and, and throw up our praise like, like God is looking for, for little pennies from, from earth thrown at him with worship. And we come in here and we don't trust God with our marriage. We don't trust God with our finances. We don't trust God with our children. We don't trust God in our character. We don't trust God in our work site. Because you can have faith. The devil believes. But there's an issue that exists within the church. And this is the thing that God was revealing not only for his body, but for me. We like to quote Proverbs 3, 5 through 6. Trust in the Lord with all thy heart. And lean not, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he shall direct your paths. You know that word lean? I was reading the definition in the Hebrew. The lean is that when leaders used to walk into a room and they would have a board of ministers that would walk with them into an important place. And the leader would lean on the minister's shoulders or, or arms as they would walk into that important place. That's what the word lean means. The Lord says, lean not. <laughs> that means I don't want you to put your trust in anybody. I don't want you to put your trust in things. I don't want you to trust in anybody. Lean not on anything. There's nothing around to hold you up. There's nothing around to get you through. You can't lean on mama's faith. You can't lean on pastor's faith. I can't lean on my grandpapa's faith. I can't lean on sister so-and-so's faith. I've got to walk in a place with God where I'm leaning on nothing but him. I'm leaning in a place where if I fall, he better pick me up. I'm going into a place... I don't have any strength to go. Oh, but I'm leaning not on my understanding. I don't understand it. I don't get it, God. He says, stop leaning on what you trust. Stop leaning on the others. Oh, you want to quote it again? We love to quote that scripture. And I'm, I'm, I'm just pouring out what God has given Oh, God, I have faith to come, but I don't have trust to give you my tithes and offerings. I have that faith, God, but you'll never heal my cancer. I have faith, God, but you can't put my marriage back together. I have faith, God, but you can't forgive the sin that I've done, Lord. If he's a provider, 
if God is a healer, if God is a restorer, if God is a deliverer, then why don't I let him take me through the experience? Oh, let me go back. Let me go back. He says, in all your ways, acknowledge him. That word acknowledge means not by hearing, but by experience. In all my ways, I need to know God, not by the testimony of brother Mark, not by the testimony of sister so-and-so, not by the testimony of my daddy, not by the testimony of my friend, but by the experience that I've had with God when he takes me into a place where I don't have answers, when he takes me into a place I can't understand what's up and what's down he takes me into a place where I have nothing to lean on but too many of us don't want to acknowledge him you know how I know because every Sunday every time this altar is open you have to beg people to come up here brother Foster I, I don't get that I, I even ask God sometimes am I the only one that has any need Am I the only one that, am I, am, I, am I just that bad, Lord? Because, you see, we only come if it's financial. We only come if it's, well, my marriage is on the rocks. Oh, they're on fire for church now, and they, they're going to get to that altar, and they're in every prayer meeting. But when it starts getting into sin that controls your life, and you, you don't know how to break free, when you get into places where you're up against the wall and you have nothing to look for but God. And you get into a place, the experience humbles you, Brother Sal. The experience humbles you. I'm the type, I'll be honest with you, I just tell people my business and, oh, don't tell everybody your business, my wife says. Don't tell everybody what's going on. It's embarrassing. You know what? You get to a point, I could care less what you think. The devil's already talking in my ear anyways. You might as well join that corner and be with him and judge me. Go ahead. Judge me. Thank God for the dispensation of grace, Brother Tony. It's not a dispensation of judgment. Devil's in my ear. Brother's in my ear. Oh, you fell. You messed up. You, you blew it. I had no idea. Yeah. But I got faith. <laughs> my account comes back into full standing I repent with God I get back in it I come back in the presence of God I keep praying I keep seeking I keep living my righteousness is full Woo! <laughs> oh, sometimes he needs to get us into a place where you have nobody but him. Can I go a little bit deeper? Humility moves us to trust him. Jesus turned about him, Matthew 9. And when he saw her, he said, Daughter, be of good comfort or cheer. Thy faith hath made thee well, whole. And the woman was made whole from that hour. Check this out. He didn't say, I made you well. He didn't say, my power made you well. <laughs> I'm going to mess with your theology a little bit today. <laughs> Thy faith has made thee well. <laughs> How important is faith? You want to know why Satan wants your faith? Because it knows it moves God. That woman was broke physically. That woman with the issue of blood was broke financially. That woman with the issue of blood was broke emotionally. How do you know humility was involved, Brother Garcia? The reason I know is because he was in a crowd of people. And this is what happened when faith is converted. And she walks up to get him and touch him in secret. Touch him. She didn't care. She was at the point, Brother Foster, I don't care who sees me. I don't care who knows I'm here. I, I, they're talking about me in the village. They're telling me I'm broke. They're telling me I'm a joke. They're telling me I'll never get my healing. But I heard about a man named Jesus. And he walks. She walks into a place. She gets a hold of the hem of his garment. 
And this is the crazy. Jesus turns around and says, who touched me? And everybody's touching him. Faith that was converted touched the power of God. Faith, humility, and trust touched the hem of his garment. She had faith. She humbled herself. And she said, I have nothing else to lose. And she received what she asked for. Thy faith has made thee whole. I'll give you a second example. Humbleness and humility. Trying to get along. I'm almost there. I see Brother Mark over there. I don't, I don't want to get in trouble. Matthew 15, 28. It says that Jesus answered and said unto her, O woman, great is thy faith. Be unto thee as thou wilt. And her daughter was made whole from that very hour. This is faith for somebody that doesn't believe. Because see, I told you faith about somebody that, for yourself. But now this woman's coming on behalf of her daughter. <laughs> no mention in the scriptures that her daughter had faith. No mention in the scriptures her daughter was in, 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 in a room fasting and praying. No mention in the scriptures that her daughter even came to church. <laughs> Here she comes, the Canaanite woman, crying out, Oh, Jesus, Son of God. She comes begging at his table. This is how bad it is. The disciples dismissed her. Get this lady out of her way. I can deal with people in church snubbing. I, it's okay. I, I've been there, done that hundreds of times. It's okay. I'm all right. But when Jesus snubs you, Jesus said, I've come but to the lost sheep of Israel. He pushed her away. <laughs> For many of us, We'd pick up our stuff and walk out of church, and that's it for me. <laughs> Humility steps into the picture. <laughs> oh, master, for even a dog eats the crumbs off the master's table. <laughs> All of a sudden, Jesus turns to her. Humility steps into the picture. She had the faith. Humility steps in and trust grabs a hold of God and he says, as you've asked me, it's going to be done. I just need a crumb. I just need a morsel. I just need a little bit, God. Give it to everybody else. Just let me have a crumb for my daughter. Those of you that are praying for loved ones that are lost, don't give up. Don't give up. I'm not going to quit. I'm not going to throw in the towel. I have a, I have a brother-in-law. God has delivered him so much. God has saved him so much. He's died at least once. He saw God and Satan talking to one another. And God was saying, no, he's mine. You can't have him. He deals with alcoholism and he battles all these things. And he goes through all this. He's running amok. He's, he's doing everything with anybody he can. And he's on the verge of leaving his family. Baptized in the name of Jesus. Filled with the Holy Ghost. We were there the other day. My flesh wanted so much to go up to him and just say, What are you thinking? And God took me to this lady. The girl didn't have any faith. But the mama had faith for her daughter. I told my sister-in-law, we're praying. We're fasting for him. We're crying out to God for him. Even when he doesn't have faith. Faith, humility, and trust will turn the hand of God to his child when they're crying out for a need. <laughs> oh. I don't know, to me, that, that, that gave me hope. That was good enough for me. I, I go home, I'm fine. First Peter 5, 6. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God. I'm almost there. That he may exalt you in due time. Humble means to submit oneself 
in a lowly spirit to the power and the will of God. Peter's strength was made weak. His confrontational spirit was crushed in his failure. His failure took away the ability to boast in who he was. His failure revealed the importance of his faith in Jesus Christ. Anything he had done before should have been annulled. Anything that he had completed or had done with Christ should have been wiped out. But this is the great scripture that Paul wrote in 2 Corinthians 12 and 9. Praise team, everybody, you guys can come up. I'm on my, going down to my last part. My strength is made perfect in weakness. We love to quote it, but we don't want to live it. That word effective, or that word, my strength, my strength is made perfect, that word perfect means my strength is most effective in them that are weak. <laughs> See, we fight God. No, I'm not going to change. I don't want to submit. But Brother Tony, I'm realizing something. I've tried everything. I've tried to figure it out for God. There's a place he's taken me in my life and it's getting worse. I look at everything and it looks, I feel like I'm in the front of a tsunami and I can feel the, the rustling of, of water coming against me. But how do we get to the place that Job said, though he slave me, I'm going to trust him. I've never understood it until now. Because Brother Foster, I don't have answers. There's nothing for me to lean on anymore. And I say, God, if you let me die in this, I'm going to trust you. If you bring me out of it, God, I'm going to trust you. I don't know what's going to happen. I don't know what's going to take place. But I am saying to you, though you slay me, I will trust you. Because what do you do? When you're done all you can. You know what God told me? He told me in 1 Peter 5 and 6. Humble yourselves under the mighty hand of God. And in due time, he shall exalt you. When the time is right, in due time means when the timing is only perfect oh God why can't it be my time because you're leaning on your understanding there brother John why can't it be now stop leaning on what you know lean on me when there's nothing to lean on lean on me when your legs are given out and when you're overwhelmed lean on me and in due time exalt you I will save you stand with me this morning and I'm going to close all this to be said all this that God has been given and it doesn't end there because God told Peter when thou art converted strengthen thy brethren he told him when you come back to me I want you to go to the brothers and help them to stand firm. You know, God has never used anybody of high position or power. God has always used the weak and the broken. People that have aborted their babies. People that have lived their life a mess. People that came from prison and drugs. He said, 
when you're converted to strengthen your brethren. The problem we do is we get the salvation we need and it's like a lollipop. Mm, this is so good. This is my lollipop. We put it away and we strengthen no one. I don't get this. Because of what I have been through and what God has taken me through, if it can help somebody else escape what they've been in, I'm going to pull them out. Why? Because I've been there. I know what it's like to feel like the world is collapsing on you. I've been there. I'm going to strengthen you. God isn't taking you through what you're going through to reserve it and to hold it away and say, I'm never going to use it again. Can you imagine if Peter had done that? We would have no church. God could have found somebody else. But do you know that he predicted who he was going to be before he ever fell? I'm going to build the gates of hell and not stand against his church. Peter, you are the rock. And I will build my church on that rock. This same man who could not stand up for God is the same man that died for him. This same man that couldn't stand up for God is the same man that spoke his word boldly and was not afraid and not ashamed of who he was. There are things that God has you in. There are places that God has taken you. But the problem is, is he can't humble us. Now I'm going to end with this. And I'm going to take a snapshot of King Ahab. And you might think that's a weird place to go for humility. But do you know when King Ahab was approached by Elijah, and Elijah the prophet told him, after he had killed Naboth and stole his land. Elijah came up to him and proclaimed all the judgments the dogs would lick their blood. Your kids will die violent deaths. You will go into the streets. You, you, will, be, you will be destroyed and utterly massacred. And do you know, when Elijah left that room, King Ahab tore his clothes off. He put sackcloth on his body. It's a type of repentance. And the Bible says he mourned and fasted before God. This was one of the most despicable kings there ever was in the kings of Israel. And God says to Elijah, Elijah, do you see what Ahab has done? He has humbled himself before me. Go tell him. This is what gets me, Brother Foster. It's not going to happen in his lifetime. But it will happen in his sons. You want to trust God? Humble yourself under the mighty hand of God and he shall exalt you in due time. Pride is the biggest thing that holds us back from humility. I'm, I'm not like that. I'm, okay, I'm, I'm sorry. You're, you work on your righteousness then because I have the righteousness of God over here. Careful when you have a self-righteous spirit because you're operating on your own righteousness and there is none righteous, no, not one. Sometimes God has to take us to a place of being humble, Brother Lee because we won't do it ourselves. We won't do it ourselves. Who wants their faith converted this morning? Who wants their faith fully converted that God would move in ways you've never seen before? I want to invite you to this altar this morning. I'm not going to beg you I'm not going to plead with you. Somebody here needs a word from God. Somebody here needs their faith converted into trust. Somebody needs their faith to mix with humility 
so they can trust God for an answer they cannot see. Somebody needs to learn not to lean on their own understanding. Somebody needs to come. You don't have a need. If, if everything's good in your life, if everything's perfect, can I ask you to come to pray for somebody at this altar? Can I ask you to pray around somebody that's, that you see? Don't let your faith fail, Satan. Don't let your faith fail. It's the currency of heaven. It pleases God. Your faith brings the righteousness of Christ. Stop listening to the enemy. Stop listening to the devil. Stop listening to the enemy. That you've gone too far. You've fallen too much. You too much. You're too messed up. You're too lost. You're worthless. You're nothing. Break every chain. Break every chain. Faith. Break every chain. I speak faith. I speak faith. I speak faith in the name of Jesus. I speak power. Faith by the power and the authority of the Word of God. I speak faith. 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 Don't let your faith fail. Don't let your faith fail. Break every chain. Break every chain. Break every chain. The chains are broken. You're forgiven. You're washed in the blood. Break every chain. Get a hold.